The SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket launched another set of Starlink satellites on May 26 from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida, marking the 29th Starlink mission and the company's 16th launch of the year. The booster was on its second flight, having previously launched the Sentinel-6 Ocean Science Satellite in November 2020. One of two halves of the payload fairing used in this mission was on its fifth flight, the first time a payload fairing section had flown five times. After separating from the second stage, the rocket's first stage landed on a drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. This launch also marked the 100th consecutive successful Falcon 9 launch, a streak that started after a June 2015 launch failure on a NASA commercial cargo mission. Nearly 65 minutes after liftoff, the rocket's upper stage deployed its payload of 60 Starlink satellites into low Earth orbit. With Wednesday's launch, SpaceX now has delivered 1,634 working Starlink Internet satellites in orbit, giving SpaceX enough spacecraft to complete the first layer of its Starlink global Internet network. The company anticipates all its current satellites should be in their operational orbit by the end of 2021, which will enable service for 80% of the world. The polar orbiting satellites, which will begin launching from Vandenberg Space Force Base later this year, will give the Starlink network complete global coverage. On April 27, the FCC approved SpaceX's request to fly the company's 4,408 Starlink satellites at lower altitudes than initially planned. And last week, California-based Viasat Inc., which provides broadband services from geostationary orbit, had petitioned the FCC to stop, or at least slow Starlink's expansion, as FCC is legally obligated to assess the mega constellation's environmental impact before approving SpaceX's request to launch the satellites. Viasat is currently developing a three-satellite broadband constellation in geostationary orbit that will expand its operations globally, providing 3 terabits per second throughput. According to Eric Ralph, the senior spaceflight reporter of Teslarati, under this hollow pretense of concern for the environment, what Viasat actually wants is for the FCC to catastrophically hamstring Starlink, thus saving the profit-focused company from having to actually work to compete with SpaceX. Moreover, in its request to FCC, Viasat stated that it will suffer competitive injury if Starlink is allowed to compete directly with Viasat in the market for satellite broadband services. If the FCC does not grant a stay by June 1, Viasat intends to go to the United States Court of Appeals, where it will seek a stay and review of the modification order. On May 26, Lockheed Martin announced a partnership with General Motors to work on the design of a rover that future astronauts can use to zip around the surface of the moon. The two companies collaborated to pitch a conceptual lunar terrain vehicle to NASA's Artemis program. The vehicle will use an autonomous driving technology and is being designed to traverse significantly farther distances than Apollo-era buggies. Just like those moon buggies from the 70s, the concept of the Lockheed General Motors vehicle will be fully electric. The heavyweight collaboration between Lockheed and General Motors came after NASA asked the private sector to develop a human-rated lunar terrain vehicle. NASA had only a few minimum specifications for lunar terrain vehicle concepts. The vehicle should be capable of driving autonomously on the moon's hazardous crater lot in terrain and be fully electric and capable of recharging itself internally or externally. It should be able to carry at least two fully suited astronauts including the driver and any cargo for a total hull capacity of 500 kilograms on a single charge for at least two kilometers. The rover is still in the early stages of development, so details on its size, weight, and range aren't set in stone. According to Lockheed Martin, the rover will be made of very lightweight, strong and resilient materials and will have a long life as it possibly can. The Lockheed Martin General Motors rover would be able to preposition itself autonomously near a landing site prior to the astronaut's arrival. The new lunar rover concept would be expertly outfitted to drive over rugged terrain in the dark and cold. Lockheed Martin will lead the team by leveraging its legacy and history of working with NASA. General Motors, which is investing $27 billion in the project, will develop state-of-the-art battery electric technologies and propulsion systems that are central to the company's extensive electric vehicle strategy. NASA will award the contract after evaluating the submitted proposals. If the project is selected by NASA, the rover would be used on the upcoming Artemis missions. After five successful flights, Ingenuity encountered an in-flight anomaly during its sixth flight attempt on May 22. The flight was designed to expand the flight envelope and demonstrate aerial imaging capabilities by taking stereo images of a region of interest. 
The 1.8 kilograms Ingenuity was commanded to climb to an altitude of 10 meters before translating 150 meters to the southwest at a ground speed of 4 meters per second. At that point, it was to move 15 meters to the south while taking images toward the west, then fly another 50 meters northeast and land. Telemetry from Flight 6 shows that the first 150-meter leg of the flight went off without a hitch. But 54 seconds into the flight, Ingenuity began adjusting its velocity and tilted back and forth in an oscillating pattern. This behavior persisted throughout the rest of the flight before landing safely approximately 5 meters from the intended landing location. During the flight, a glitch occurred in the pipeline of images being delivered by the navigation camera. This glitch caused a single image to be lost, but more importantly, it resulted in all later navigation images being delivered with inaccurate timestamps. From this point on, each time the navigation algorithm performed a correction based on a navigation image, it was operating on the basis of incorrect information about when the image was taken. The resulting inconsistencies significantly degraded the information used to fly the helicopter, leading to large oscillations. Prior to landing safely, onboard sensors indicated the rotorcraft encountered roll and pitch excursions of more than 20 degrees, large control inputs, and spikes in power consumption. Despite experiencing this anomaly, Ingenuity was able to maintain flight and land safely on the surface because of the considerable effort that has gone into ensuring that the helicopter's flight control system has ample stability margin. Perseverance documented Ingenuity's first five flights but did not do so for the sixth flight. The rover is now starting to focus on its science mission on the Martian surface. On May 29, China successfully launched an automated cargo resupply spacecraft to rendezvous with an orbiting module in the second of a series of missions needed to complete its first permanent space station. The Tianzhou-2 module blasted off on a long March 7 rocket from the Wenchang Space Launch Center on the southern island of Hainan. Three minutes into the flight, four strap-on boosters and the first stage of the rocket separated from the upper stage. Seven minutes later, the Tianzhou-2 module separated from the second stage and entered into a low Earth orbit. A few minutes later, the spacecraft deployed its solar arrays as expected. The uncrewed Tianzhou-2 is carrying 4,700 kilograms of pressurized cargo and 2,000 kilograms of propellant with it. Eight hours later, Tianzhou-2 matched its 343 by 371 kilometer orbit and autonomously docked with Tianhe the 22,000 kg core module of China's planned space station, which was launched to a low Earth orbit on April 29. Tianzhou-2 will transfer propellant to Tianhe to maintain its orbit and deliver supplies to support crewed future missions. Tianzhou-2 is the second of 11 missions needed to complete China's first self-developed space station by 2022. China is planning to send three astronauts to the Tianhe module on a three-month Shenzhou-12 mission, scheduled for June 17. Check out our previous video to learn more about the Chinese space station. Link in the description. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. While everyone is waiting for the second suborbital test flight of Starship serial number 15, the company appears to have decided to retire the rocket instead of flying it again. On May 25th, four days after SN15 was reinstalled on SpaceX's suborbital launch pad B, a crane was attached to its nose and a transporter staged beside it. One day later, the historic Starship prototype was lifted off from the launch pad, installed on the transporter, and rolled away from the launch pad towards SpaceX's Boca Chica factory. This is likely the biggest sign that SpaceX has retired the most successful Starship prototype to date. According to RGV aerial photography, it looks like SN15 might be mounted on one of the display stands at the build site. Starship serial number 16, which appears to be almost completely integrated, has been in the high bay for about a month. There's a limited possibility that Starship SN16 could be heading straight to the scrapyard instead of sending to the launch site for a suborbital flight. SpaceX has already cancelled and scrapped Starship serial numbers 17 to 19, and currently they are focused on building and testing an orbital-class Starship prototype and Super Heavy booster. Ultimately, it's more likely that SpaceX would rather go all-in on Starship's inaugural orbital launch attempt, even if that means little to no ground or flight test availability for a few months. A recent FCC filing says that SpaceX plans to conduct a 90-minute around-the-world mission that will originate from Starbase and culminate with a controlled re-entry and splashdown in the Pacific Ocean near Hawaii. They are planning to send Starship serial number 20 atop Super Heavy Booster BN2 for the orbital test flight no earlier than July 1. 
The super heavy booster for the orbital flight, Booster BN2, is currently being stacked inside the high bay. In his recent tweet, Elon Musk mentioned that there will be no thermal protection system tiles on the backside of Starship flaps during its orbital flight. But he added that there will be some tiles towards the leeward side of the ship. According to him, there will be no entry burn for Starship like the one in Falcon 9, rather it will perform aero braking upon re-entry at an angle of attack of 70 degrees. He also mentioned that SpaceX aims to have hot gas thrusters on the booster for the first orbital flight. SpaceX uses cold gas reaction control system thrusters in Starships, where pressurized nitrogen gas is used for attitude control during re-entry. In hot gas thruster, the oxidizer and fuel are supplied under gaseous helium pressure to the RCS engines. Usually, dinitrogen tetroxide is used as the oxidizer and monomethylhydrazine as the fuel. These hypergolic propellants are supplied to the engines where they atomize, ignite, and produce hot gas and thrust. According to Elon Musk, a hot gas thruster is five times more efficient than nitrogen, and SpaceX is planning to use hot gas RCS thrusters in future Starship flights. Elon Musk recently confirmed that SpaceX is planning to have 29 Raptors on Super Heavy Booster initially, and the number will be increased to 32 later this year. They are also working to increase the maximum thrust that a Raptor can deliver, aiming for more than 7,500 tons of thrust from the booster in long term, with a thrust-to-weight ratio of 1.5. He also added that Raptor production is approaching the rate of one engine per 48 hours. Ahead of the planned orbital test flight, the company is in the process of building an orbital-class launch tower for the gigantic vehicle. The second launch tower segment, which was transported to the launch site on May 21, got stacked atop the base segment on May 24. A Lieber LR11350 crawler crane assisted the stacking operation. Two days later, on May 27, the third section of the launch tower got rolled out to the launch site from the build site. The next day, this section got stacked atop the previously installed second segment. The launch tower is now taller than a fully assembled Starship. The fourth launch tower segment has already been built and is waiting for transport at the build site. SpaceX needs to build and assemble three or four more such segments to complete the 140 meters high launch tower. On May 28, a cryogenic tank shell got rolled out to the launch site from the Starship factory. This structure acts as an insulating cover around the ground support equipment tanks installed at the launch site. GSE tanks hold cryogenic liquid propellants to support orbital Starship flights. These insulating shells provide thermal insulation between the interior and exterior, reducing the rate at which the contents inside the tank boils away. Recently a new batch of methane subcoolers was delivered to the fuel tank farm at the launch site. Built by Kennedy Tank and Manufacturing Company, these shell and tube heat exchangers are used to subcool methane below its boiling point. These kinds of heat exchangers consist of metal tubes passing through another metal enclosure, referred to as the shell. Two fluids of different starting temperatures flow through the heat exchanger. One flows through the tubes, and the other flows outside the tubes, but inside the shell. Heat is transferred from one fluid to the other through the tube walls. The fluids can be single or two-phase and can flow in a parallel or a counter-flow arrangement. The type of heat exchanger spotted at the launch site is a two-pass straight tube heat exchanger, billed in accordance with the Tubular Exchanger Manufacturers Association. A recent Starbase flyover by RGV Aerial Photography spotted super heavy hold-down clamps lying next to the orbital launch table at the build site. These clamps secure Super Heavy firmly onto the launch table during Starship stacking and ensure that the launch vehicle stays on the launch pad in all kinds of weather. These devices also had to have the strength to hold down the launch vehicle after ignition until all engines registered full thrust. Then they automatically and simultaneously released the launch vehicle for liftoff. They did not have to overcome the full power of all the engines as the great weight of the fueled vehicle counteracts much of the thrust. Twitter user Lunar Caveman sketched the hold-down clamps detailing its operation. There will be 20 clamps holding the booster firmly before liftoff. These support arms will retract during liftoff, releasing the launch vehicle from its grip. There could be a water deluge system integrated onto the launch table, through which water will be sprayed onto the launch pad to help protect a rocket, launch tower, and launch pad from the extreme acoustic and temperature environment during liftoff. Recently, a stainless steel section with an unusual opening on its side was spotted inside a Starship manufacturing tent by Starship Gazer. This could be the cutouts for Super Heavy grid fins. A Super Heavy test tank, recently renamed Booster BN 2.1, is now fully assembled inside the midbay. 
This test tank will undergo a pressure test to failure to test the structural integrity, just like Starship test tanks. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.